we as we phase out um, and still deal with several COVID cases around the state. All righty. If you are listening to us on Facebook, just want to remind you that we will be following the comments there. So if you have questions, please feel free to add questions to the comments section on Facebook. And if you're joining us through Zoom, questions can be asked through the Q&A feature. So it looks like two little message bubbles at the bottom of your screen. Please go ahead and ask those there. We'll go ahead and um, allow for questions after we touch on each topic. We have our amazing Question facilitator, Ronnie, who will read some of those questions and have the ELD team answer some of those, um, depending on time allowed. And questions that we might not get to today, we'll try our best to uh, follow up with via email afterwards. All right, and let's get started. We'll go ahead and get started with our legislative recap. And we have our amazing Troy Duker here. If you want to introduce yourself and share with us some updates. Thank you. Thanks, Karina. I'm Troy Duker and I'm the Government Affairs Manager for the Early Learning Division. So I act as a liaison to the legislature uh, and assist with developing the policy and budget for the agency. Next slide, please. Um, when I was asked to do this ledge update, I was thinking, uh, ledge update, it seems so long ago, um, but the legislative session did end the first uh, week of March. So it's been about two months uh, since the legislative session ended. Um, and we're thick into planning for uh, the 23 session uh, now. So there wasn't too much breathing space between the end of uh, last session and this uh, upcoming planning period for 21, uh, or excuse me, for 23. Uh, but one of the great things that came out of last session is we got nearly uh, just about everything we asked for uh, out of the legislature. And I'll go through some of those uh, bills and investments uh, here now. We'll start with House Bill uh, 4005. Uh, early care and education governance. Um, you all likely remember House Bill 3073 from uh, the 21 session that established the Department of Early Learning and Care and transfers the transfers over the employment related daycare program uh, to that new department uh, in July of 23. Uh, what this bill did, among many things, uh, was it delayed the establishment date for the Department of Early Learning and Care to July 1, 2023. Uh, previously, that had been January 1 of 23. And the thought behind this was to have that establishment date align with the uh, beginning of the new budgetary biennium for the state. So the state works on a two year budget cycle. Um, that budget cycle begins July 1 uh, of a year and ends on uh, June 30 of the next year. Um, as well as uh, that July 1 date aligns with the transfer of the employment related daycare program from the Department of Human Services over to DELC. Um, also in the bill, uh, we transferred over the license exempt background check process for our child care providers who receive subsidy through the employment related daycare program. Um, this was something uh, that had been underway because of an audit uh, that had taken place in 2020 by the Secretary of State's office. Um, but since the uh, employment related daycare program was transferred to the agency in House Bill 3073, we needed that authority to complete the background check process on those license exempt providers uh, to follow uh, that body of work as well. Um, so we're anticipating to have full enrollment by July 1 of 2025 for all of our license exempt providers in ERDC. Next up, uh, the legislature increased the employment related daycare reimbursement rates for child care providers. Um, and the cost of the state for that was $26.6 million, uh, which the legislature did grant uh, to the agencies to implement that uh, uh, rate increase. Um, and those rates will be effective uh, June 1 of this year. Next slide, please. Um, earlier, I mentioned the 2020 Secretary of State audit on child care background checks. Um, so that audit took a look at the background check process for child care at the Oregon State Department of Human Services and within the Early Learning Division. And the audit found that there was inconsistency in the back. Um, there was no consistency over the type of background check that was performed, the criteria uh, for those background checks, or the regularity um, of the uh, uh, of those background checks. Um, and so the audit recommended that the early learning division um, uh, uh, use the same background check process, which is a central background registry that we use for uh, license uh, providers for the the staff and volunteers of recorded programs. Uh, so Senate, Senate Bill 1547 um, was the bill that 
encapsulated that policy change. Um, and so enrollment for new staff and volunteers in recorded programs will begin January 1 of, ne of next year. But anyone who's a current employee uh, or volunteer of a recorded program as of December 31st of this year um, can uh, wait to submit their application for enrollment uh, by June 30, but they have to have that application in by June 30 uh, to remain compliant uh, with that new statute. Hospital 4033, uh, the next on the list, uh, took a look at the Tribal Advisory Committee. Um, the Tribal Advisory Committee is a committee that will inform the work of the Tribal Early Learning Hub. Um, so they're going to determine the function, uh, uh, purpose, and administration of that hub. And we needed to take another look at the composition of that advisory committee to ensure that the government-to-government -government relationship fostered by the state um, and the nine federally rec recognized tribes was uh, reflected in the composition uh, of that group of folks. Um, and so with agreement uh, with the nine federally recognized tribes, um, we worked on uh, building an advisory committee composition uh, that fits uh, both the work of the division um, and uh, the work of the individual tribes and the purpose of the advisory committee uh, for informing the work of the tribal early learning hub. Next slide. Uh, so the legislature made some significant investments in child care supply and capacity building uh, this year. Um, you'll notice the, th the three organizations um, that start this list here, Neighbor Impact, Uval Creek, and United We Heal. These programs had what we called ready-to-go plans uh, for uh, child care supply building. Um, so each of these organizations, um, as you can see here, received, uh, well, I'll just start from the top, $8.2 million for Neighbor Impact. Uh, which is a, a community-based organization out in the Bend area. $1.2 million for Uval Cree, uh, which is an organization located in Ontario. And then $7.9 million for capacity building uh, initiatives uh, for United We Heal Training Trust. Similarly, um, there was $22 million allocated to seating justice in this last session. Um, but this looks a little different than the other community-based organizations. Seating Justice will be setting up, setting up a grant uh, program process uh, so that uh, child care providers across the state could submit applications to receive funding for ch uh, child care capacity building uh, grants. Next on the list is $21 million that was allocated to the Oregon Center for Career Development and Child Care at PSU. Um, and the purpose of these funds is to uh, give uh, child care staff retention payments. Um, these payments will come in the form of uh, two payments, one this year and one next year, at about $500. Next slide. Um, and then finally, uh, the legislature had invested $68 million in uh, the early learning divisions, early learning programs in the 21 session. Um, the legislature held back $38 million of that investment so that the division uh, could come back to the legislature to show capacity uh, for expansion of those program dollars. Um, we successfully did show capacity to implement those program funds. And so the, the legislature approved the release of $38 million, the additional $38 million uh, for Preschool Promise, Oregon Pre uh, OPK, uh, and then Healthy Families Oregon. I believe that's it. Thank you, Troy. Rani, are you seeing any questions in the chat? No, not at this time, Allison. Thanks for asking. Okay. Thank you very much, Troy. If questions come up, that was a lot to process, a lot of updates this past session. Um, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We can either get back to you tonight via the Q&A feature, or we can follow up via email. So thanks again, Troy, for being here. And thanks, we'll hand it over to Gwen. Hello. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking um, everyone for their interest in the early learning programs. And I'm really pleased to be here. And one of my colleagues, Angela Stinson, is here with me as well. So I'm Gwen Bachtel. I'm the early learning programs director. And my preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I think we'll jump right in to the next slide, if that's all right. So, um, I guess I'll start with kind of my role. Um, I have the um, opportunity in my role to support a team of 14 um, staff that oversee six of the state funded um, early learning programs. And those programs, as you can see from the slide, are Baby Promise, Preschool Promise, Relief Nurseries, Oregon Pre-Kindergarten, 
um, our state funded Head Start and Early Head Start, um, the Healthy Families Oregon, also the Early Child Equity Fund, and we also house the Head Start Collaboration um, Office, and that is a, we receive a federal grant um, to support a position to work on alignment of um, systems to the Head Start model. So these are all the six programs that are in our unit. And as I said, there are 14 uh, staff members, but we also work very closely with our community systems team, which includes uh, the supports for CCRNRs, early learning hubs, coordinated enrollment, coaching, professional learning, and also the grants and contracts unit to get all of our work done. And I think um, our, our unit's function is to um, support program design, implementation, and quality oversight and evaluation of all six of these programs. And our evaluation focuses on positive outcomes for children and families, and also positive outcomes for the grantees that participate. And I think we'll go to the next slide. Now we're going to kind of dig in a little bit deeper. It's a pretty high level overview of this, of the programs, but um, and oh, before I start, I'll mention that um, funding for all these programs, we have um, state general funds. We also now receive funds through the early learning account, which is um, backed by the corporate activity tax, which was enacted with the Student Success Act. So we now have um, funds coming in through that um, tax as well. There's also um, some of the programming is funded through the Child Care Development Fund or the Child Care Block Grant. And as I mentioned earlier, there's some program that is funded through the Federal Office of Head Start. We don't oversee those funds, but it does support programming at the local level. Our total state investment um, per biennium right now for all these programs is approximately $500 um, million or half a billion dollars. And with the federal Head Start children um, added into the mix, it serves all these programs serve about 26,000 children and families. All right, so now I'll dig in a little deeper on the Healthy Families of Oregon. So Healthy Families Oregon is an evidence-based free program um, for new and expecting parents. It is a home visiting model and families are referred through community partners, maybe a hospital or families may reach out directly. Um, in Oregon, Healthy Families um, started in 1993. So it's one of our longstanding programs and we currently have 15 grantees. One of our newer programs is Baby Promise. It's a full day, full year um, program for infants and toddlers um, working with families from um, typically 200% federal poverty level or lower or qualifying for ERDC. And it's currently in six counties or three early learning hub regions. And those would be Multnomah County, um, Central Oregon. So a few counties there, and then also South Coast. And currently the program is serving 175 children and it's approximately um, two years old in services. So this is one of our newer programs um, in, the, in the portfolio. Next slide, please. And then our, one of our longest standing programs is our Oregon pre-kindergarten program. And we're really working to, um, with some new investments in the prenatal to three programming um, that follows the early Head Start model. We're really looking at, this is sort of kind of a name change maybe in the future to Oregon prenatal uh, to kindergarten, still keeping it as OPK. But this is our state funded um, program that models um, after the federal Head Start model follows all the same standards that Head Start does. And it um, includes an array of models. We have for preschool a part day or a full day model. And then in our prenatal to three programming, we, there's a home visiting model. There is locally designed options and then also a year round center-based model. And um, we're currently serving with our state funds, um, just over 7,700 preschoolers and just over 1,100 infants and toddlers or expecting parents. And let's see. And we currently have 30 grantees in, um, included in the OPK program. And then for the Early Childhood Equity Fund, this is one of our newer programs that is funded through the Student Success Act or Early Learning Account that I mentioned earlier. It's in around three years of service. Um, and this is an interesting model because it um, supports a broad range of culturally specific early learning um, um, programming and also parent supports. And the programs or grantees that are participate have to meet certain um, specifications to um, meet the definition of culturally specific organization. And there are two types of grants with the equity fund. There's planning grants and also service grants. And currently they're serving, um, even though they're newer programs, serving just over 3,000 children and families. So next slide, please. And then Relief Nurseries has been around for a, a long time as well as a state funded program. Um, Relief Nurseries has a couple different options or, um, for services. 
One of theirs is a um, therapeutic early childhood program for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. Um, they offer respite care, they offer home visiting programs and family support and education. Um, their services are for children zero to five and really targeting services to families with um, characteristics that make them a priority for the, for the funding. And there are 16 relief nursery grantees at this time. It's not um, statewide, it's not in every community or county, um, but they are serving 2,500 families and children. And then Preschool Promise is one of our sort of newer programs as well. It's around six years old at this time. It currently um, is statewide reaching um, every county. Um, there are 173 grantees and we're serving um, just over, um, I'm sorry, just under 3,800 children with this program. Um, and it's a mixed delivery model. So that means that there's uh, many different provider types that um, are eligible to become a grantee. And we're gonna touch on that later in the slide. So I won't go into full detail here. And all families um, who are receiving services through the Preschool Promise Program are have an income at or below 200% uh, of the federal poverty level um, or their children in foster care or experiencing other characteristics that would make them a priority for this um, program. Next slide. And so I think there were, so, so that was a very high level overview of the, um, of our programs. Um, but I know there were some specific questions about the expansion for Preschool Promise. Um, as Troy mentioned earlier, we received some uh, funding um, in this biennium name to expand Healthy Families Oregon, um, our Oregon pre-kindergarten program and also Preschool Promise. Um, but for Healthy Families Oregon and OPK, those funds will go, um, are already being distributed for expansion of services to the existing grantees. But for Preschool Promise, we will be releasing an RFA. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, um, Angela, to go through the next few slides. Angela, you're all set. Thank you, Gwen. Yeah, next, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, as Gwen mentioned, we are expanding. Um, and if you're interested in Preschool Promise, uh, we're so happy to tell you more. Uh, some basics you might want to know are that the current award is $12,360 per child with an additional $408 uh, if transportation is offered. Um, interested applicants would want to be willing to serve priority populations of children and families in their area ready to serve at least 900 hours per year between August 1st and June 30th, um, ready to serve at least six hours per day and at least four days a week. Um, programs should be ready to, to demonstrate program quality, uphold all grant requirements, and continue to work on quality improvement through their local child care resource and referral, and to collaborate with the Early Learning Hub on recruitment, family eligibility, and enrollment. That is something really special about Preschool Promise is that we partner locally uh, with folks in the CCRNRs to, you know, work on continuous quality improvement in our programs. And then the early learning hubs are recruiting and enrolling children uh, around the community locally. Next slide, please. Uh, and as Gwen mentioned, we are a mixed delivery model, which means that a huge um, number of programs are eligible to apply. And that includes uh, certified family and certified center child care providers, community-based organizations, culturally specific organizations, federal Head Start programs, federally recognized Oregon Indian tribes, early learning hubs, uh, education service districts, Oregon pre-kindergarten or P OPK, um, private preschools, public schools, public charter schools, relief nurseries. Uh, we serve children in just a wide variety of learning environments. So it's very... Um, it's an exciting opportunity for, for many folks. Next slide, please. If you are interested in growing with us, um, the first thing you want to do is go over to the OregonEarlyLearning.com webpage. Um, you'll see this first button at the top here that says subscribe for news and updates. And when you click, um, you'll see a little pop-up where you can subscribe to the child care provider updates. That is where we'll be announcing information as soon as our uh, RFA or request for applications is launched and we hope to be able to provide you more information uh, then. Thanks so much. I'll pass it off to whoever is next. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Gwen and Angela. Um, Ronnie, do we have any questions? I saw some come through. Yes, we, we do. Great. And um, let's see. 
um, Troy, uh, someone wanted to know how could they get more information on community-based grants? We still have Troy. I'm still here and I don't have a good question that I answer, or a good answer to that question. Um, we're working on a communications plan with the community-based organizations that will be um, uh, running those grant processes. So I have hope to have more updates uh, sometime after the 16th of May. Um, but Al did place uh, a link in the chat uh, that has the childcare updates and I'll be sure to update providers uh, on that web page. Thank you, Troy. Uh, we also had another one. Um, are the uh, this is regarding the um, the money for the retention funds? So, are Head Start staff able to receive the OCCD retention funds? Uh, yes, I do believe they will be able to receive the retention funds. It, what we're doing is we're the reason we're using OCCD at PSU is because they hold all the names of folks um, who are registered in ORO. Um, and so if you're registered in ORO, um, you will uh, automatically be eligible for those funds. Uh, but I also believe they're gonna be setting up a process for folks who are not registered um, to get them in the queue for those uh, wage or uh, retention uh, payments as well. Thank you, Troy. And Troy, would you have any information about the um, the background checks for recorded programs? Are is there any different process for them to be following right now? They will receive communications from the Office of Child Care, uh, but what they'll have to do is uh, fill out the employee will have to fill out uh, an application for enrollment in the central background registry. Um, and if there's anyone on from OCC, they might be able to explain that process a little better than I can. Um, but the recorded programs will be receiving communications from the Office of Child Care once we get those rules in place for the uh, uh, background checks for uh, recorded program staff and volunteers. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe we have Miriam on there. Miriam, did you have any additional information to add for that? Uh, I, I don't at this this time, actually, I mean, you can find out more about how to apply for the central background registry on our website. Um, I think there's a link directly to an online application. But before we know um, more specifically about the process and the timelines, which we'll communicate out, like Troy said, from Office of Child Care, I'd, I don't have much more to add. Thank you, Miriam. Gwen, this question will be for you. Um, could you um, tell um, one of the participants how many OPK programs receive both state and federal funds? That, and then uh, will you have any open to new grantees in the future? Yeah, thanks, um, Ronnie, and thanks for the question, Dan. Yeah, so currently we have 30 OPK grantees and 25 of them are state and federal um, funded. Um, for this, for the federal funds, there's three different avenues, or there's the sort of our traditional Head Start program, then there's also the Migrant Seasonal Head Start program, and then also there are some tribal Head Start programs across the state. So um, we have two of the tribes who receive federal um, Head Start dollars participating in OPK, and then also the Migrant Seasonal Head Start program, Oregon Child Development Co Coalition also receives uh, the state OPK grant. So for, and I was thinking, for open to new grantees in the future. So for federal grants to open up in the future, that's usually um, through what the Office of Head Start calls a designation renewal system. That's if there's an underperforming grantee that has to go through recompetition, then their grant would um, be competed and there could be a new grantee. And then for um, Oregon pre-kindergarten, um, to date we have, um, anytime we've had expansion um, of funding and investment in the Oregon pre-kindergarten, we have, um, had that expansion go directly to the um, 30 grantees that we're working with, um, and they've been um, able to fulfill most of the expansion. So I think, and then, and I, th I think that sort of answers that. Thank you, Gwen. We also had another question. Are you able to speak to the qualifications for Preschool Promise, or perhaps where can they find that information? Okay, is that the, um, will there be grants available for recorded pro? preschool programs or is it a different? No, someone asked. Oh, what okay, I see the qualifications. Thank you, sorry, I had to get oriented there. Okay. Um, yeah, so to be eligible um, to apply for Preschool Promise Grant, um, 
you need to be one of the provider types that Angela outlined earlier. And then also um, you need to be willing to um, offer the services that are required um, by the program um, and also have fewer than uh, two or fewer serious valid um, findings in the last 24 months um, meet the insurance requirements of the program. And I'm trying to think if there are any other sort of eligibility considerations and um, your willingness to participate in SPARC. Thank you for that. Um, could you speak about the planning grants for student success? Do you have any information on that? You know, I think what I'll do um, is get back on that question because the planning grants are for the Early Childhood Equity Fund, and I can make sure that there's information, but I'd want to check in with the um, program specialist, Kimberly, on that to make sure I don't misspeak. Okay, thank you. Um, Troy, this question is for you. Uh, could you explain what retention funds are? So, um, because child care staff uh, often uh, don't receive adequate wages. Um, we're hoping to, uh, I mean, as little as it is, um, give out uh, $500 in retention payments um, to help uh, with those low wages for child care staff. Um, so these payments uh, were an investment from the legislature um, to sort of encourage uh, retention among child care staff. Thank you, Troy. Um, Gwen, how does somebody apply for Preschool Promise? Um, to apply for Preschool Promise, it's through the um, request for application. Um, that'll be released um, late spring. And so it's a comprehensive um, application that will um, require the applicant to answer questions around their quality and philosophy of um, early care and education, along with submitting budgets and other documents. So there isn't an open application right now. Soon okay. to come. Thank you. Um, and Alyssa, if you could do information about any additional grants coming this summer or for recorded programs? Hi, um, as of right now, there were no uh, resources given to the Early Learning Division specifically for recorded programs, and we haven't received any new federal dollars, so uh, we don't have any plans at this time. Um, again, as Troy mentioned, those retention and recruitment uh, payments, um, if folks are registered in ORO, they'll have access to those resources um, once they're distributed later this year. Thank you so much. Okay, it looks like Allison, we're okay for now. Oh, let's see. Um, it looks like maybe perhaps, oh, we had a Spanish question of what is required to provide baby promise. Gwen, are you able to speak to that about the baby promise program? Yes, sure. Um, similar requirements to preschool promise in regard to provider settings, but mostly it's been focused on in-home providers and smaller centers. Um, let's see, and I think the question is about licensing and it would be required to be licensed if the provider type is a um, license, like it's not license exempt. Okay. But I'll just mention again, Ronnie, currently it's in um, three early learning hub regions and just um, within six counties. So if the individual is curious and um, they can reach out and I can give them more information about the, the six counties that are participating right now. Thank you, Gwen. And Gwen, while you're here, uh, you had mentioned that Preschool Promise is six hours a day. What about if a program uh, only operates for four hours a day? Are they eligible for uh, to apply for Preschool Promise? Um, they would be, they would need to increase to six hours a day to be eligible to apply. Thank you. Okay, one last question on the retention funds, Troy. Um, Troy, are the retention funds for the programs or for the employees? Those funds are for the staff. Okay, thank you so much. And I'd love to, along those lines, there was a question on Facebook that said, are staff under 18 years old eligible for the $500 payments? 
I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't know the answer to that question because I don't know what their, their, I don't know how oral works well enough to answer that question. So I don't know if that's something I can find out from uh, OCCD at PSU um, or whether someone else on this call might have the answer to that question, but I don't know it. Okay. And that might be something that we could learn as the uh, program gets more grounded. Um, That's exactly Allison, right. Yeah, Allison and Katrina, I think we're ready to go for now. Thank you so much, Ronnie, and thanks, Allison, for um, helping out there too. We'll go ahead and jump over to COVID-19 updates. Looks like we might have a few more things to share, but Miriam, welcome back. Hey, thanks. Happy to be here and happy that each time I present COVID-19 updates, I feel like there are fewer and fewer to share. Um, so yeah, I can get started if you wanna flip the slide. So just a reminder, um, the guidance, the COVID-19 guidance updates were made available on our website April 11th. So you can find the um, COVID requirements and recommendations document there, uh, COVID-19 resources for providers tab. Also there we have the exclusion chart. So that walks you through when, uh, when you have a child or staff with symptoms or when they were, um, if they were, exposed and what to do. Um, the OHSU nurse hotline for child care providers is still available right now and is active until June 30th. Um, we're going to phase that out after June 30th. The numbers of calls that they've received have dramatically decreased. Um, what we still will have available to you is um, the provider contact email address that you can see here. Um, you still have your licensing specialist for questions and then always, always call the local public health authority because they will definitely have the most up-to-date information and be able to provide you the more, most informed information that, that you need to your questions. I think that's about it. Thank you. Great, and we don't see any pressing questions regarding COVID from what I'm following here. So with that, we'll go ahead and transition to information regarding to the transition to the Department of Early Learning and Care. So welcome to our director, Alyssa Chatterjee. Thanks, Karina, and good evening, everybody. Alyssa Chatterjee, I'm the Early Learning System Director. Um, Karina mentioned the surveys we've been giving, and we know that some folks would like to know a little bit more about the Department of Early Learning and Care that was established last legislative session, as Troy mentioned. So we just wanted to let you know that we've heard you, and we are working on getting you some additional information about um, the status of implementing this new agency. We will be launching on July 1 of 2023, so we've got, got some time, but it's getting close, um, but wanted you to just be aware that we do have a page on our website that you can see here at the bottom um, for the latest F uh, frequently asked questions and information about where we are, um, including reports that we've recently given, and that we'll have more information to share on a mission, vision, and values survey that's coming, as well as some opportunities for virtual conversations. We really want to make sure we design this new agency with you in mind and try to have um, processes and visions and goals that really allow, align to what you you'd like to see from us as the Department of Early Learning and Care. So more to come on that. Great. And Ronnie, do we have any last questions coming through? It looks like we might be finishing up this evening a little early, if not. Sure. Um, let me, uh, Alyssa, do you know anything about um, additional grants coming for individuals coming from Ukraine, uh, I guess, associated with childcare. 
That's a great question. At this time, we don't have any specific grant funding available for families who are arriving from Ukraine, but it's a great question and we're happy to kind of uh, look at those options with the governor's office. Okay, thank you. Um, that looks like it for now. Uh, we have staff um, that are currently in the Q&A answering um, other um, specific questions to individuals. Um, so we don't have any to, uh, to say live at this time. Great, so we'll go ahead and just thank everyone for joining us this evening. Again, if you would like to receive the latest information and latest updates, please for those childcare updates. <laughs> That's my dog going out with the bang here tonight. And um, we'll go ahead and see you again in July and please keep an eye out for those invitations. You will have the link here if you're on Zoom and our Facebook to a survey um, follow up for this webinar. So again, thank you, thank you all so much for all that you do and may you have a wonderful evening.